So good morning, everyone. It is a delight to see each one of you in person, close enough to see the whites of your eyes, almost. It is a great time, and as Brad mentioned, we are starting a brand new series. You know, we've been in a very abnormal time. We all understand that. And as we begin this process of returning to a new normal, whatever that's going to look like in weeks and months ahead, we thought maybe it would be a good opportunity for us to just refocus for a few weeks on the church, on our church, Grace Community Church, talk about what it means and why the name that we have is such a significant part of our lives and why we think it's important to us and to God. And so next three weeks, we're going to be focusing on each part of that name. And today I have the privilege of focusing on the very first word, the word grace. If you find the back of your bulletin, you'll see the outline is there. And today's sermon title is called the, A Gospel of Grace. You know, when you think about the word grace, it has both a theological as well as a practical meaning. Most of us understand what the word means uh, on a practical, personal level. What does it mean to be gracious? You know what that means, you know? You understand, you have a picture in your mind of what it means to be treated graciously. But maybe grace, the doctrinal aspect, isn't quite as clear in your mind what it means. And so we want to deepen that this morning. There is an acrostic at the top of your outline that's sort of the, not original with me, it's been the kind of thing you learn in Sunday school. But grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And that really does sum up very completely the biblical concept. But maybe it leaves for you a question about your own personal life application in regards to how you live your life and what our church means and why we've chosen that as part of our identification. To help you understand my background and understand what this, why this word means and something important to me, I need to take you back in my history, oh, maybe almost 40 plus years, to my last year in seminary. I lived with my wife and kids in Winona Lake, Warsaw, Indiana. I went to Grace Theological Seminary. And that last year in seminary, I agreed to teach an adult class that whole year, which means that I showed up at church a little bit earlier than most of the people did. We met in a gymnasium where the adult classes were. I had to kind of set up and get things going. And so I would get there, and when I would come each Sunday morning, there would be a guy who was the head usher. I think his name was Bill. As I recall, he was salt and, salt and pepper kind of hair. He's probably in his early 50s. He was the usher, the head usher the whole time I was there, and he was always there with a bulletin and a big smile and, and kind of created an atmosphere like we expect around here. I went to a church that was called Fellowship Baptist Church. And so it, it, again, chose a title in its name that would reflect, we would think, the idea of fellowship, connection, relationship, being part of the Queenie Knee, and so forth. So one Sunday morning, I show up in late winter, probably, I don't know, February, March, and, um, and there was no bill to hand out the bulletin. And I walked, and usually I'd turn right to go over to the gymnasium and figure out what's going on, and instead I turned left, and... And I noticed him, I was walking like, you know, it seemed, things seemed a little charged that morning, and I wasn't sure what was going on, and I, I saw him, and he was walking out, he was, he was obviously um, distraught, he was red-faced, he didn't have his tie and his coat on like he did, but suit, pants, white shirt, and he left. I thought, whoa, something's going on. So I saw someone, and I asked, I said, hey, well, what's going on here? And they said, well... Um, uh, Bill's wife, evidently, last week was mentioning some of her girlfriends at church that um, before she and Bill were married, that Bill had been married once. He was like a 19-year-old kid and lasted a year or two and got divorced. And, you know, we have this rule, if you've been divorced, you can't do anything. And so the pastor removed him. It just came to light. And I thought to myself, wow, really? For something that happened like 20-plus years ago in his life? And then I realized, which I kind of already knew, that within that church culture, divorce was, review, was kind of viewed as the unforgivable sin. And I realized at that time and since that, that sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, church culture is more important to people than biblical truth. It's more important, like, we've always done it this way, don't confuse me with the facts, I know what I believe kind of a thing. 
So that happened and then moved two years forward and I'm now the new pastor at Grace Baptist Church here. And I realized that I encountered the very similar situation. That is, since that same cultural value was there and it was still viewed as some kind of an unforgivable thing that would happen. So I spent many years teaching Bible and about grace and so forth and what it meant to be people of grace. And eventually it came down to a vote. When we called our first associate pastor, um, about eight or nine years after I had been here, and he revealed in the, beginning, in the candidating process that he too, as a young man, had been married for a while, and then they divorced, and he'd been married to his current wife, and they were been married for many, many years, and they had kids and so forth. And we had to decide, and it came down to a vote for us. And I think for every pastor, there is a sort of defining moment in the life of his church that you decide whether it's going to take or not, whether people have been hearing it or not. And I remember driving home telling my wife, Louise, you know, if the church doesn't vote for him because of this thing in his past, I don't think I can stay here. I can't, I can't be a part of something if they're not going to understand what grace is about after all the time I've been preaching about it. Well, the good news is um, they voted to accept him, and he came, and that opened up leadership for other people. And, and so here I am 30 years later, still here. Um, but what it means, grace means for us as a church, is that there are no unforgivable sins. That's what it means. There are no unforgivable sins. It's, it's what the gospel is good news about. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 8, he said, Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from all those things that we regret, from free from all those things we said and did and so forth in our past, set you free from the law of sin and of death. So laying that foundation, that little bit of a background for you, let's this morning dig a little deeper into this grace concept with a biblical text that really does define why Romans 8 that I just read to you is, is true. And it's going to be found in the book of Titus. You have the verses in your outline. You may want to follow along in your Bible or open up your device, Titus chapter 3. Titus is one of two disciples that Paul had that he sent to represent him. He had a young man who's named Timothy. You're familiar with that, perhaps. Timothy was sort of a mild-mannered, gentle-spirited guy, and often Paul would say, don't, you know, don't hurt Timothy's feelings to the church he was ministering at. He sent him to Ephesus, Ephesus to be kind of the same thing that he got a hold of Titus, who's this sort of a roughneck, man's man, Greek convert in your face if he needed to be kind of guy. He sends him to, to Crete, which is an island south of Italy there in the Mediterranean Sea, to shape up a very rough crowd of Christians and to do that within a very rebellious culture. And so he had tough duty. And in, in Titus 1, he kind of defines that. He says, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains. Why? What's going on? He says, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers who must be silenced. Titus, if you have to get in their face, you need to do it. Because they are upsetting whole families. In fact, he says, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Not very kind words, but Paul throws in his two cents and says, I think this testimony is true from my exposure to him. For this reason, he says, reprimand them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. So for two chapters, uh, Paul focuses on church leadership qualifications and church relationships. But then in chapter 3, he broadens his scope of his focus to their life outside of the church. And he begins to talk about God's grace in doing so. And so we see the, the display of grace that God expects from us as Christians, but first of all, as citizens, as citizens who would respectfully obey those over us. So in verse 1, he says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to slander no one. I have to stop and pause. Do you think that Titus 3, 1 
has anything to say to us in the current political culture in America, with local, state, and national elections just a few days away, and particular to us as Christians in it? Well, I don't have time much to spend this morning on that topic, but I believe the answer is yes. I believe that God would look down on modern-day America in the 21st century in much the same way as he looked at that first century culture of Crete, and he would probably describe what we've been seeing, rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, liars, people who are slandering one another, and he would see it pretty much the same as he saw them. And so to both cultures, he says, remind them. And you can't stop them. I can't stop any of you who want to put stuff on Twitter and Facebook and all that. But I can remind us that as Christians, this is not how God intended his grace to be shown to the world. Their identity as Christians has to take priority over their identity as Cretans. Why? Because each one of them, and trust me, all of us, each of us, is a child of God's grace. So it's the same for us today in the United States. We hold dual citizenship, do we not? We are, we are citizens of the country of our birth, or naturalized here, and we love our country. But we're also citizens of the kingdom of God because we've been born again. And one is temporal, one kingdom is eternal, one is just a journey for a short time, it's passing away. The other is our eternal destination. So one would expect that that would be the priority that guides our actions and words and thoughts. To realize that God is not telling us not to care about our country or the political process. We do love our country. We are concerned about it. He's though telling us how to care for it. And we care for it by reflecting Jesus and his grace. First, as citizens who respectfully obey and don't slander. And secondly, as neighbors who are gently meek, as neighbors who are gently meek. He says in verse 2, do not be contentious to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people. Now that last phrase I read to you is sort of a play on words. He literally says, show all meekness for all people. And we ask, is that possible? Is that hard to do? Well, it, it probably for us without God's grace is really impossible. I mean, all meekness to some people all the time might be possible, or some meekness to all people some of the time might be doable, but to show all meekness to all people all the time who we might describe as liars and maybe even so strong as say evil beasts, harsh people, that requires truly a double measure of grace. And when we think about that, the question naturally arises, both then in the first century and now in the 21st century, why? Why should we do that? Why should I show grace as a citizen or as a neighbor to people who don't deserve it? People who are, by their actions and words, demonstrating that they really deserve God's judgment for sin? Well, that's a good question. And here's God's answer. It's because, point two in your outline, of the despair without grace that God saw in us. Not in them, but in us. He says in verse three, for we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. He says, we were once foolish. You know, foolish is like that word grace. It has a double meaning. We all understand probably the personal, practical aspects of foolish. As a parent, you may have even told your child at some point in their educational process you know, you didn't study, you played on your, you know, your games, and now you didn't study for the final, and you took the final, and you got a poor grade or a failing grade. You were foolish how you chose to spend your time. You understand that word. Or uh, you would say to someone, you took your entire savings, and you put it into a speculative 
a project investment, it went south, and you lost all your money, you were foolish to be hasty to do that. Foolish. Or maybe more personal, close to home, we would say to someone, or they would feel like, you know, you, you didn't know that person very well, they had a checkered past, yet you entrusted your heart to them, and they broke it. You were foolish to be that risky. We understand how that works in a lot of different levels of life. But here's the question. What does it mean to be biblically foolish? When God uses the word in the Bible, when Paul uses that, we were once foolish. What does that mean? Well, the clear black and white answer to that is given by David in Psalm 14. This is what he says. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He describes what that looks like in life. They are corrupt. They have committed detestable acts. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven from the sun, upon the sons of mankind to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They've all turned aside. Together they are corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. I don't think David meant there weren't people who were doing nice things for each other. It's in the context of what good ultimately means. When Jesus was approached by the rich young ruler and he said, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, whoa, let's talk about something first. He said, there's no one but God that's good. I mean, in an absolute sense. So what are you saying here? See, this is a very graphic picture of total depravity of mankind and our need for God's grace. And understand this, for the fool to say in his heart, there is no God, is to assert that I have no God in my life and I have no need for one because I am the master of my own life. I am the, the, the captain of my own fate. I'm doing it my way, apart from God. I don't think there is a God. I don't need a God. And this has always been the great spiritual watershed of mankind. So our Paul said in Romans 1, for even though they knew God, not that they personally knew God, but mankind look around at the world around them and life and the heavens declare the glory of God and all the different things, and they have to decide, is all this just a cosmic accident or was there a designer behind it all that had to do it? They understood that from inside and from outside, and yet it says they did not honor him as God or give thanks. What happened? They became futile in their speculations, and their, there's that word again, their foolish heart, I don't need God, there is no God, their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, when that happens to humankind, where does that leave one spiritually? Paul describes that in this verse. I've sort of summarized it to say this, our sinfulness, mankind, has left us hardened, hopeless, and hateful. That's what he said. You look at the world today, you look at what we find in the historical record. This is what we find in the historical record of how men treat men down through the ages of time. This is what you find today in the latest news headlines. You see attitudes and actions that reflect a hardened, hopeless, and hateful attitudes and actions. Paul says, let's take an honest, hard B.C. before Christ, before conversion, look at our lives, at ourselves. And, and were we any different, really, than the people out there we want to critique? Or well, maybe we were not as bad as we could have been. That's probably true. We didn't do everything that some people have done in their lives. But none of us were good in that absolute sense. All of us were guilty on multiple levels, many times over, of these same kinds of sinful attitudes and actions. We were addicted to our sins, unable to change our ways, and angry about that within ourselves, and that anger was reflected toward others with a lack of love. And so we reacted to people who were different by, by ethnic background, educational, economic, uh, political, philosophical, you name all the differences we encounter in this world, we react to people who are different by either fighting, slandering them, attacking them, or fleeing from them and trying to find our own little, you know, holy bubble somewhere, depending on our personality, or we did a little of both. Folks, this spiritual condition 
of depravity, of sinfulness, reflects in both our journey in life and the predictable destination for people like that. There's no hope. Their life is leading them away from God. Which, in my mind, is why the most important word, the most important word in God's grace story, at least in our English language, is that little three-letter word, B-U-T, but. It defines, it's found throughout the New Testament, and it describes the disruption of grace that God initiated for us. He says in verse 4, but. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared in Jesus. I mean, what a double contrast of intent and action in the midst of our sinful darkness and hatred, divine light and love shows up to save. It was unexpected, it was unanticipated, it was undeserved, it was all dependent on God's good grace. That God rescued us from the greatest evil by bestowing upon us the greatest blessing. He says he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness. What, what does that statement mean? It means that there was not one thought in your life or mine, one word or action we did in our lives that God could look at and say, that is good enough. He, she, deserve, are worthy of my grace. No, the Bible paints an opposite picture, that the wages of sin in our lives have earned us God's condemnation of separation and death from him. In contemporary terms, it was fair compensation for work done. It was just payment for being a fool and saying in our hearts, I don't need God. The payment, of course, is that we receive our heart's desire. If you choose to live your life saying, I don't need God, I don't want God in my life, then guess what? At the end of your life, you'll have your heart's desire fulfilled in an absolute sense. You'll be separated from God's life, from God's love, and from God's light to be left alone in a godless darkness with your hatred. That will be what you want, and that will be what God gives God's grace, though, disrupted our life journey. That's Paul's point. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. And appeared in our lives, first of all, to save us from sin's penalty of judgment. From sin's penalty of judgment. As Paul told the Romans, we have been removed from being under the law of sin and death. But we say, how did that happen to us exactly? Well, he describes that here. He says, But in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So first of all, we notice it's all of grace, his divine mercy toward us. But he uses the word regeneration, and he uses the word renewing. It's sort of a, it's a double, it's, it's two phrases talking about the same process. Regeneration is that doctrinal term that describes the how of our salvation. And what it describes is that moment in time in your life when the Father sent the Holy Spirit into your spirit to implant there his principle of divine life and to reverse the direction of your soul towards him and toward holiness. So at the deepest level of your personhood, spirit, at the deepest level of who you are, you have been radically changed. Jesus said it was such a radical change that it's like being born again. It's like having, becoming a whole brand new person. In fact, that's what you became, a brand new person. Paul says you were a new creation. You've become a new creature in Christ. You're still human. You still look the same, weigh the same, have the same personality, introvert, extrovert, choleric, melancholy, whatever. All that's the same. You're still human, but now you are alive to God and living instead of being dead to God and just dying. God's goal in our renewal by the Holy Spirit, secondly, was to sanctify us from sin's power through holiness. That means that the governing disposition of our soul is made holy. Our 
our internal paradigm of right and wrong comes now into line more and more with God's paradigm of right and wrong. And the more we walk with Christ, the more we learn of his grace and truth, the more we look back over things of our past and say, I'm embarrassed by that. I, I used to take pleasure in that. I don't, know, I don't know how I could do that, but I did then. As the Holy Spirit delivers us from the pollution of sin, he renews our whole nature into the image of God, enabling us to do God's will. And the Holy Spirit, he says, has been poured out, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace. Justification is another one of those doctrinal words that's loaded with meaning. Being justified is a judicial act in which God places all of our sin, your sin, past, present, future sin, he places all that on Christ and on the cross, and he declares us, not just, not just pardoned of all sin, not just, well, I know you're guilty, but I'm gonna let you go. No, no, no. Justification means that he declares us uh, innocent and guiltless of all charges of sin. That's what justification means. Just as if I've never sinned. That's how God sees you. And thinking about that, justification by grace, it should boggle our minds when we consider the scope of it. I mean, why would God choose to do this? I look into my own life. I'm not near as good as other people I have known. Why would God step into my self-centered, sinful, self-destructive life and the path I was on to disrupt it, to disrupt that path to adopt me as his child? Why do you do that for you? What's his end game? How does this story end? Well, folks, that's the most amazing aspect of grace that God's story does not end for us. Paul goes on to write, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You're an heir to eternal life. Right now, you possess eternal life. That is your legal inheritance by God as God's adopted child. You did absolutely nothing to gain it, and you can do nothing to lose it. It is yours by grace, by divine decree, by divine calling, and by the indwelling as the Holy Spirit has indwelt your spirit and sealed your soul for all eternity. Folks, this is our blessed faith hope. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said this, In him, that is in Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, there's only one truth, not many, only one name, only one way, Listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you trusted in Christ. He said you were sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise who's given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. You know, God's end game is very simple. He saved us from the penalty of sin. He is sanctifying us from sin's power the ultimate end game is to separate us from sin's presence for all eternity. He's going to separate us from the very presence of sin. Right now, the taint of sin and the many shadows of sorrow surround us at every turn and juncture of life, do they not? None of us can fully escape them. We can't escape sin, sin staying, staying within us and how we sometimes even now do things we regret. Or can we escape its pain all around us? We see it and we feel it every day that we live within this world of brokenness and within these mortal bodies, a body that Paul describes in Romans 7 as the body of this death. But you know, one day, each of us will lay aside our mortality. These mortality, these containers are wearing out for all of us. And one day we will lay aside these earthly containers. But the gospel of grace tells us that that's not the end of our story, but rather just the beginning. And when that day comes on the other side, I'm guessing that you will probably, for the very first time, actually meet your guardian angel, that one who God has sent to escort you all the way through your life, 
who was a wall between you and Satan, who delivered you from so many foolish choices and kept you alive. You'll actually meet him as he escorts you into the presence of the living God. And as you enter your final destination, your arrival will not go unnoticed. You know the ultimate welcome team is going to be there. I've been telling each service, Ed's been trying to recruit from each service a welcome team, by the way. You may want to join that. But the ultimate welcome team will be there to celebrate with you the completion of your faith journey. Just as the writer of Hebrews suggests, he says, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, cheering us on, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, folks, looking ahead, this verse says, to your soul, you being completed in the Father's presence, was the joy that Jesus saw and felt as he endured the shame of the cross. Our shame, our sin, placed on Jesus. So God could save you from sin's penalty, could save you from sin's power, and one day save you from the very presence of sin. This is what grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, meant to Jesus. This is what it meant to the Father. And this is what it currently means to the Holy Spirit as he brings you home to the Father. And that's why we unashamedly identify with this as his church. This is both our confidence, this is our claim. That we, all of us, we are what we are by the grace of God alone. That's our only boast, his grace. And you know, if you're looking for a church family and home to be a part of, you are welcome to join us. You are welcome to walk with us as long as you are willing to do so by resting in and rejoicing in a grace that makes all sin forgivable. That's our story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close our time, I pray and ask, Lord, that you will surely take these verses and the truth around them and bring them into our hearts and minds. You'll give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we'll truly understand what it means to have your grace disrupt our life and the path we're on to save us for all eternity, and to make us part of your adoptive family, your forever family. Father, may we live our lives in light of that. May we show, whether it be election season or every other season, may we show your grace as you want it to be displayed. Uh, people who, who live in a world still controlled by hate and hardness and hopelessness, and don't know any other way to live, may we, by our lives, show them, Father, there is a better way, a higher path, a path that's named by grace, that's filled with your unconditional love, drawing us, each one, to yourself, drawing us for all eternity. Father, may you give us a confidence to walk with you. May you give us, Father, the joy of the Lord as we do so each day of our lives. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So next week, Ed will be here to talk to you about the next part of our name, a community of transformation. I encourage you to be back and be part of it. It's going to be a great series as we get back to being normal more and more. Uh, stay tuned. It's still changing. But God bless you. We'll see you next week.